Welcome to the Royal Chronicles. I'm Hannah here with Lou. Hello. We are back and today we're going to be in Russia. Um, we'll get into the specifics of that in a minute. But first, of course, we want to say thank you to all of our listeners, whether you've been with us from the beginning or you're new. We're really glad you're here. We appreciate your time. We hope you're enjoying this, um, the content. Uh, if you're not already, make sure to follow, share, subscribe, all that good stuff on our various social media platforms. We're pretty active on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and very active on YouTube these days where we have an additional show affectionately called Tea and Shenanigans, where we get into all of the modern royal gossip so if that's your speed definitely check it out um but today luke you want to get straight into it we've teased this in some other episodes we talked about it a lot um we are going to be delving into the much discussed um story of the romanov family specifically of course the final czar nicholas ii um many books have been written films made documentaries i personally have seen I can't even tell you how many different. Um, it is a much discussed yes, topic. Yes, I could. <laughs> there's a lot of information out there, but we feel that there are some things that aren't talked about it as much. You get the highlights, and of course, um, not to give it away. The cartoon yeah, there's even a cartoon movie about it, Anastasia. But I mean, sort of, <laughs> not really, sort of. <laughs> But people always seem to focus on the very end. And of course, it is terribly tragic and gruesome. And we will we'll speak about that. But there's a lot more that went on. There was a lot in the lead up. up. Yes. So, Luke, I think we decided we're going to start with the death of Tsar Nicholas's the second Tsar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to breeze past that. The death of his father, which is what made him Tsar. Um, and as I understand it, they didn't have the greatest relationship. Is that accurate? Yes. Um, at least from everything I've read, it really just seems like they didn't get along very well. And his father really tried to keep him out of, you know, anything to do with the government or ruling as long as he was alive. Well, and oh, now that you say that, because it just triggered, we were speaking before we started recording about how. Uh, Nicholas wasn't particularly interested in governing or the things, the business of government or the, the business of state that would make sense if his father wasn't interested in including him or yes. there wasn't a lot of encouragement. <laughs> uh, that's a terrible, that's a terrible mistake. You're raised and, yeah. I mean, when you're literally going to be the ruler of like the biggest country in the world and leader of the wealthiest family in the world you really kind of need some training leading would, up to that you would think so but let's get started with it so kind of give us a an overview we talked off mic before we got on here and i wish we had just been recording then because it was so much good material but kind of give us the the overview the lead up to nicholas becoming czar the Mm, controversial arrival of his bride, the Tsarina, and just kind of how things developed from there. So um, all kind of uh, happened quickly at, in a short space of time. So um, the Tsar Alexander, the father of Nicholas, um, died in a um, sort of, not suicide, but bombing. He was um, assassinated. Mm in St. Petersburg. And um, right after that, he, um, Nicholas's then fiance was scheduled to come to Russia for their wedding. So she arrived in Russia just before the funeral for his father, mm. which didn't seem very auspicious at the time kind of a bad omen for her coming to Russia. Mm -hmm. At least that's the way a lot of the people at the time looked at it. They should have paid more attention to what we call the optics in the modern world, I suppose. Yeah, it might have been best if she'd stayed home for a few months. And wasn't she a relation of Queen Mary of Great Britain? So basically everyone was related at this time. I know we've been through this before, but yeah. Yes. So... Um, Queen Mary of England was a descendant of the Cambridge line of the Hanoverians. Um, so that would be Queen Victoria's father's brother was her <laughs> ancestor. And um, Alex, the future Tsarina of Russia, was a descendant of Queen Victoria. So they're all kind of distant cousins. Mm-hmm. Okay. But the important part for what I think you're leading up to, which is what they sort of uh, 
I don't know, made an episode about in the crown yeah. was more we or less just kind of that, that all of these different princesses across Europe were kind of in competition with each other, saying, you know, who was going to get married to the, you know, the best crown and who would be, you know, the best empress or queen. Mm-hmm. And that it was some sort of like competition between the two of them. Mm-hmm. Why is it then, when, after what happened at the end of the crown, was they went to Poland, Germany, not to UK? So they like kind of related to the two. Okay, so the question is, after the fall of the the family, why did why did mm-hmm. they not? Some of them, some of the rem, so they brought the, the, the name. Like the one who were keep bringing all those impulses of Anastasia and the rest of. Kids, mm-hmm. the one who recognize them. She was the nearest one to the family, the last one to see the family. She lived, I think, in Germany or Poland. Um, the family kind of spread out mm-hmm. after the revolution. Some of them went to Germany, a bunch of them went to Paris um, to live in France. Um, the former um, Empress Dowager, so the mother of Alexander, Mm -hmm. I mean, wife of Alexander and mother of Nicholas was the one in Paris. Mm -hmm. She was like the one that everybody who had a, who had a, you know, fake Anastasia, she was the one they wanted to convince. Oh gosh. Is it like Sophia or something like that? Uh, No. no, uh, um, Gosh, that's terrible. I should know what I'm... Was the wife of the captain... That he was so close to the Romanov. Oh, I have no idea. At that time, <laughs> she was the one. Who- um, well, her regnal name was Maria. Okay. I must be thinking about somebody else. Anyway, that was a little bit of a rabbit trail. Yes, we're going to put a pin in that hole, what they portrayed in the crown. But back to what you were talking about. So uh, Nicholas has become czar. He, you know, his ne- his wife arrives and it's kind of under this black cloud. And yes. people perceive it as a bad omen. Um, also his choice wasn't the most popular. He had basically selected his future empress by, he met someone that he got along well with and that he liked and that she liked him. And that wasn't necessarily what the rest of the family back in Russia wanted. (gasps) Be still my heart. (laughs) Possibly choose to marry someone on those for those reasons. Yeah. So as you can tell, there's some culture clash Mm -hmm. going on right now in the family. Mm -hmm. So um, she arrives. She's already not popular with all the family. The emperor was just assassinated. Um, And now her fiance is about to become emperor and they're about to be married. Mm -hmm. So it, it, everyone's a a little stressed out. Yes. Kind of in a bad mood. Cranky. They need a Snickers bar. They need a snack, you know, like (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> need some vodka that, there's the <laughs> suggestion right there okay so this is not the um, the most positive atmosphere um but it doesn't seem i mean correct me if i'm wrong it doesn't seem as though it really gets a lot better for them it depends on how you look at it um through the early years of their reign and marriage um things aren't going super well for their country Um, But they're going pretty well for them because, you know, once again, being uh, the head of the richest family in the world Mm -hmm. and ruler of the largest country, you can sort of isolate yourself from things you don't want to deal with. One of their largest, biggest, I should say, glaring mistakes. Yes, which is compounded by the problem that they also isolated themselves from the court Mm -hmm. because of their kind of unpopularity. They weren't very... It's kind of weird to say, but it's like they weren't very fashionable or popular with their own court <laughs> because they didn't tend to fit into the roles that had been traditional for the czar and czarina. So basically, they just kind of almost went into retirement, doing what they wanted to, living on their estates, and they let um, Nicholas's uncle deal with most of the government and military issues and his mother deal with all of the, you know, public and social hmm. events. So they, the, the czar and the czarina, they were just poorly suited for their positions. Definitely. On, just on a personal level, sounds like. Because the way that their government and the state of Russia was set up, you had to be a controlling, not very nice person hmm. <laughs> in order to be successful. And they were neither of those things. They were just pretty not 
complicated. They liked simple things, their home, their children, and they weren't into all of the pageantry that went with the social side. And he wasn't interested in the government or military. Hmm. That's unfortunate. That's funny. I saw a video on YouTube where I'm trying to think everything they said, but basically they were saying that his biggest fault basically was that he was just too nice. That's that has been something a lot of people have said about him. Yes. I mean, nice, but at the same time, it's just there was weakness there, which is unfortunate. Yes. But also when you think about, like I was saying, when the standard is that you have to be ruthless and willing to, you know, just wipe out your enemies. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a different level. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> but I can't really rules. see another way um, to how else do you rule an empire? That wow. was a question that was going around at the time. And with the, hugs and kisses. I mean, I really don't think that that I would mean, work. And basically it what it seems like they were hoping for was that they could be like the British Royal family mm. where basically they kind of had an idealist family and home life. And they sort of exuded moral strength but that's really not how Russia was designed to be ruled. Mm. It was designed to be ruled by very harsh people who were willing to destroy their enemies and crack down on anyone who opposed them. Go figure. Yeah. Mm. And okay. they also don't seem to have been willing to reform the country, to make it one that they could rule in that way. Mm. And who knows if that even would have been possible. Is it true that they were interested in um, kind of I'm trying to think if it was them. They were kind of on a let's westernize the place sort of. That had bent. been a on and off attempt by the Romanovs uh, for several generations, mm -hmm. deciding that they want to be more Western and they want to, you know, orient Russia more towards Europe mm -hmm. and then pulling back and trying to become more independent from Europe. Well, it's interesting because you and I were also speaking about this off mic that, uh, and this is, this was common with Royal families across the world. They were the Imperial family of Russia, but they weren't Russian. Not very, no. They and were very German. that seemed to matter to the Russian people more than it did to say, I don't know, the, the Greeks or even maybe the English to some extent. Mm -hmm. It became more important, especially um, because of sort of movements that had been sponsored by Nicholas's father. So Tsar Alexander started a pretty uh, intensive program of nationalization, mm. trying to make the Russians have a more nationalistic spirit, the way that it had started to develop in Germany and the way it had been in France and England, mm -hmm. um, especially since, like, like we said, it's an empire. So it's all of these different peoples spread all over this huge piece of territory, and he was trying to pull them all together with an identity. Mm -hmm. The only problem with that is that his family didn't actually fit the identity that he was trying to pull people towards. <laughs> <laughs> so it became a problem when his son was ruling and people started saying, so we're all Russians together, but our emperor and his foreign wife are German, mm, which doesn't really had work. a sort of cognitive dissidence. Yeah. They didn't seem to have realized they started. See, it's interesting because you would, you would have thought, I would have thought that one of the solutions to that would have been, uh, you know, for the members of the royal family, start marrying Russians and producing at least partially Russian heirs. You, you know? would think, but in that respect, they kept being very, very Western European mm. where, you know, every, you have to marry someone who's from outside your country, who's from a family that's, you know, more or less an equal with you, not a subject. You know, if you think about it, it's almost this kind of, I don't know, medieval s concept of marrying you know f to form alliances and that sort of yes. thing yes yeah it was brothers, it went to the male heirs mm -hmm. yeah. which that's a good segue thank you very much so for they had before his death something happened and it went to uh, one of the so um, mm -hmm. after the rule of Empress Catherine, Catherine her son um, 
put forth the, a law the, the stating woman. that no female member of the family could ever inherit her the throne. Own, her own son. Yes. He hated her oh. so much. Oh my yeah, gosh. There, there was a time that it went to two brothers and they, there have been like kind of a, almost a civil war between them. So it ended up both of them ruling at the same time. Yes. So that was um, Tsar Peter the Great. Or, mm -hmm. um, he and his brother were both joint rulers mm -hmm. for a time. And that was a kind of complicated situation because they were both sons of the previous czar, yeah. but from two different wives. So it had mm -hmm. kind of like mixed up the succession. And that was just the compromise. It was like, we'll just let them both rule and whoever lives the longest will. <laughs> no. Well, there you go. Okay, so. So um, there's all sorts of family drama going back with the Romanovs and you know, rules like that it. they had established for succession and, you know, backstabbing each other. Mm -hmm. It's a whole thing. It's a good segue, though, because we can speak about, um, I mean, the fact that it was so important, the whole male heir thing, the story yes. with their son, Alexei, yes. right? Who had, what was the disease? Hemophilia. Yes. Um, and it kind of goes together with the whole Rasputin situation and how bizarre that was. Um, but because you, you, we were also speaking about and you were saying how... Um, the family that is the czar and czarina were mm -hmm. i don't know if you'd say desperate but they were very keen to hide the fact that their only male heir um was unwell and in poor health because if you know if people were to know the situation it's you know blood in the water for sharks basically exactly and showing weakness of that kind you know having basically an heir that could die at any time was just asking for somebody else in the family to try mm -hmm. to overthrow you. Yeah. And probably realistically had this all played out um, <laughs> without what ended up happening to them. Um, I don't know the, the details of the son's Alexis of his disease or, you know, what his life expectancy would have been, but it sounds to me as though it probably was, would have happened anyway. Like, don't you, don't you suppose? That's hard to say. Um, because, I mean, he could have lived to get married and have children. Uh, several of his other relatives had lived long enough for that. Mm. And at that point, it would have just depended on what his descendants, you know, if any of them were sick, mm. or if they survived. It's a whole, it's a whole can of worms. It would be very difficult to unpick. Yeah. Going out for him as now, there's no internet. There was, I think, newspapers at that time, mm -hmm. right? It was a lot easier to hide things. Sick, yes, yes. yes. No, of no, course. No, he, he was sick. And the thing is with Rasputin, they kept him for... Oh, Rasputin. Feel, feel better for a certain amount of time. Like the bleeding and all that mm -hmm. was less. Mm -hmm. And he felt safe with it. Yeah, what do you... I don't know a lot of the details of the whole... I, I know the so overview of Rasputin. He was a mystic that was affiliated more or less with the Russian Orthodox church. Mm -hmm. Um, he claimed to be a healer. Um, you know, he would just like basically faith healing mm -hmm. and, um, he was brought before the Empress, uh, basically referred by a convert to his sort of cult of personality mm -hmm. who was a member of the court. And, um, he seemed to have positive effects on the symptoms of the hemophilia that their son was suffering from. It's currently believed that this may have actually been a fault of the doctors who they had had treating him because the main treatment that they had been prescribing for basically just the symptoms, the pain that he was suffering from was aspirin which a uh, side effect of aspirin on hemophiliacs is that it lowers their ability to stop the bleeding. They already have enough trouble, but it can cause it. it doesn't it thin the blood? Yes. Yeah. So it's making it even more dangerous for them. Mm. So simply having him treat their son instead of the doctors could have improved his condition mm. because he wasn't giving him things that were causing damage mm -hmm. <laughs> to his system. That's crazy. So merely the absence of a medication that was dangerous for him could have been why he was doing better. Right. And didn't he meet his end? Uh, wasn't he also assassinated? Yes. 
I don't know that story, to be honest with so, you. So um, basically, all sorts of rumors were spread about him and about how much control he had over the Empress mm-hmm. and over her close circle of friends and the Imperial children because he was given free access to everything, mm-hmm. basically, to all of them. And other members of the Imperial Court decided that he was a bad influence. He was dangerous for them because of the image he was, you know, projecting of the Imperial family Mm -hmm. to the people. So they decided to assassinate him. It's a very long and complicated story that all took place the evening of his assassination. But needless to say, he ended up dead. They had to attempt to kill him several times during the course of the evening, but he, they did end up succeeding. That's wow. why he had this thing about him that he had a kind of a, what you call it, like a supernatural power. Supernatural yes, power. Yes, which he claimed. Sure. Also, sure he, he, uh, did. he, I don't know if you'd call it a prophecy, but he made a statement saying that if he died, the Romanov family would also fall. Mm-hmm. Which, well, just, just an aside, strange mystics uh, issuing prophecies about the Romanovs was a tradition that went back several generations. <laughs> Basically, people who either fell out of favor or were mm-hmm. you know, uh, imprisoned by them often issued prophecies about their downfall. This one just happened to get lucky, I guess. Yes. And also, I mean, you know, it was kind of a bad time. There was a war. Mm. There were people in the imperial court who weren't happy with them. It was kind of, you know. The writing was it, on the wall. It was it was a likely possibility. Fun fact. We talk about Prince Alexei. Okay, fun fact, yes. There's a movie 1986 uh, or 85. It's called Anastasia the Mystery of Yeah, that Anastasia oh, movie yes. from the 80s. Awesome. Yeah. The kids who played Alexei. It was the first movie for Christian Bale to be in a movie. <laughs> that was Christian Bale. <laughs> Chris, I forgot about that. I, I watched that a long that time ago. <laughs> movie <laughs> trivia. Yeah. <laughs> How good it was he went to do uh, Empire of the Sun. Oh, yeah, uh, Empire of the Sun. That's a classic. Yeah, I remember that movie because when I was a kid, uh, mom had got it on. It was a two-part VHS set yeah. because that's how yeah. long the we movie was. Them. I think. Yeah, you and I watched. Oh, yeah, it was one of those pandemic movies. But yeah, that but that was it was so long ago that that was before they were able to prove that the woman that was claiming to be Anastasia that it wasn't true. You know, it was all nonsense. The one who played uh, the dad, uh, what's his name? The czar? Yeah. Okay. He was Umar Sharif. He was in uh, Lawrence of Arabia. See, it's I I hadn't paid any attention to that. Wow. Like, Whoa, all those names. Yeah, and I don't know that it's a very well-known film. I mean, maybe, but I don't think so. Not bad. It has some good history. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of the also. Yeah. yeah. But back on track. So where were we? I forgot. Oh, uh, so Rasputin's dead. Okay. After several stabbings and gunshots and... Hideousness. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, the Empress doubled down and was like, oh, he's a martyr. You murdered him and he was trying to save our son. So that that wasn't a great look for her. Um, the uh, czar was basically like, okay, it's over. <laughs> Let's move on. But um, yeah, so her reputation didn't do super well after that mm-hmm. because she kept defending him. Mm-hmm. And the czar basically just wanted to move on. But there there were already so many new issues going on by then that it's time to get away from them. So let's get into, tell us about when the czar, who was not particularly interested in, you know, the things of state, government, whatever, takes a more active role in those things. So and at it the didn't outbreak go well. of World War I, Nicholas made a very poor decision to assume full responsibility for the war, basically becoming the commander of chief of the Russian armed forces, as well as head of state. Mm -hmm. So um, you would think that this would be him, you know, taking command and trying to, you know, show people that there's a steady hand uh, in charge of the war effort, but this is Russia. So they did not do well at the beginning of the war. 
Germany was much more, much better prepared at the beginning because they had been looking for this war to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, so any losses that Russia suffered were Nicholas's losses. They were his fault because he was in charge mm -hmm. and because he had told the Russian people that he was in charge. So you go from, you know, I'm taking command to you're incompetent and our people are dying. So you and have then, Alexandra with her weird mystic mm -hmm. and her, you know, being a foreigner and possibly, you know, in the opinion of a lot of people, a spy for the enemy. Mm -hmm. And then you have Nicholas, who is apparently not doing a very good job. And the Russian people are the ones suffering for it. Right. So how long from when that, you know, occurs to the revolution, the overthrow? So um, the outbreak of war in uh, 1914 and then the revolution in 1917. Mm -hmm. So it's not a very long period of time to go from, I mean, at least in their opinion, full control over the largest empire in the world to being overthrown and imprisoned. It just goes to show um, in in leadership, you know, you need to be in tune with your people. Yes, aware. or at least find people who can uh, who can administer the positions of power competently. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can either be a great leader or you can be a great delegator. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have to choose though. Makes sense. Okay, in the interest of time, let's get to so um, the revolution occurs. The family is, you know, basically house arrest whatever it is. And, uh, most people are aware of, I think at this point, especially since they talked about it in the crown, the point where, um, the, the czar reaches out to his, is it his cousin? First, yes. First, co not first cousin, second cousin. Se yeah. Second cousin, the King of England, um, and is basically asking for help, um, uh, you know, a way to, to get out. Yes. Or his, his people are asking, you know, the king's people, you know what I mean? Yeah. My people are talking to right. your people kind of thing. They did that with all of their allies, um, attempting to um, be granted asylum with basically anyone outside of Russia because mm -hmm. they could see that they were not going to do well in the revolution. At this point, um, it's kind of funny to say, but everyone is very aware of the French Revolution mm -hmm. and the Russian Bolsheviks are almost cosplaying the French Revolution. <laughs> Whereas in France, the intention hadn't originally been to kill the king, but that was what happened. In Russia, the intention is very much to act out how they, you know, sort of imagined the French Revolution. Good grief. Get some original ideas, people. <laughs> And, you know, get full justice for all of the suffering that they had had to deal with by killing all the people they don't like. And, you know, it would be humorous if it wasn't so tragic what ended up happening after all that in yes. Russia. Just horrendous. I mean, we don't I'm not trying to get political here, but uh, history speaks for itself. OK, we know what happened after the Bolsheviks took power and all the rest of it, yeah. all the, the death and suffering. But uh, what I was alluding to was there is a little blip in the crown where they portray this event and um, they are alluding to, insinuating, whatever, that the reason that the King of England did not send a ship for his second cousin and, and family to then, you know, take refuge in mm -hmm. Great Britain was because his wife, Queen Mary, um, didn't like the idea because she was supposedly jealous or something of the Tsarina. <laughs> and you mentioned earlier in the episode that there was this competition amongst princesses to, or at least that's how you could portray it. Yeah. Um, there's no evidence that I've ever read anywhere from any primary sources that there was some sort of animosity between them, especially not the kind that would make her lobby against them coming to England. Mm -hmm. What I can very much believe is that she would advise against bringing them to England because at the time, you know, you're during, you're in the middle of a war and there are revolutions going on in other countries, um, ruled by your family members. The British crown was afraid there could be a revolution in England, mm. similar to what was going on in Russia. 
They didn't want to import trouble. Exactly. And there was a very strong, um, I guess you could call it a sympathy Mm -hmm. with the revolution in Russia by the English people. Because at the time this is going on, the Bolsheviks had not taken control of the revolution yet. It was still being, you know, sort of billed as a democratic revolution, Mm -hmm. that it was going to be for the benefit of all the Russian people and that it would bring them more into a modern governmental system. That's how those things always are billed, as you say in the beginning. Because if they told the truth, nobody would support them. Well, very also less the, people. The would individuals them. who were supporting that fra- phase of the revolution <laughs> were uh, all killed by the Bolsheviks, so they they were not in control for well, very that's long. That's a bad sign if ever I saw one. But um, like I was saying, it was just a very unpopular move mm. in the UK to bring in f- individuals who were considered to be foreign tyrants in a very unstable period. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, like I said, they're in the middle of a war. So that and makes more sense. It just makes you look bad to be bailing out these uh, super rich, privileged relatives of yours who have been, you know, downtrotting the mm-hmm. common folk. Uh, so it was, it was just a bad political move. Got it. Okay. So let's skip forward. There's just so much of this information, but let's get to the part that I think most people are aware of, which is, um, they, the royal family, the imperial family, I should say, was kind of in limbo for a period of time. I forget how long they were under house arrest. They were moved around a couple of times and they ended up at a house. I'm trying to remember what it was called. It starts with an I. The, uh, um, I know that it was in Ekaterinburg. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, there was, there was a name. The house had a name, but anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, Google it. It's worth a Google. Just do it. But anyways, um, so, and my understanding is that the, supposedly the powers that be were not initially, I don't think going to do away with them. Um, it seemed like for a while they, they didn't know what they were going to do with them because they were had, they had them under house arrest. They kind of moved them around. They just, they kept them inside and you know, they were just kind of waiting. Yeah. The guards mm-hmm. were thugs, of course, with Bolsheviks, so of course. Like army or- yeah. Do you do you know that there are Wikipedia pages for each one of those people? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. interesting. You should look it up. Yeah. But um, so we come to the fateful day. I think it's very very early in the morning, and they come in and tell them that. Oh gosh, are they? they took them to a room with two chairs. Well, they go in first, so, and they they wake them up, and they say, "Get dressed. You're you're going somewhere." So some. Yeah. Some uh, important background for this is that they had been moved several times mm-hmm. during their house arrest because at this time there's still the civil war going on between the the Bolshevik um led red Russians and the royalist the white, white Russians mm-hmm. who were supported by basically what's left of the interest that the allied powers Wait had a second. to give. What relation what relation does that have to the white Russian as in the drink? I would guess that that was probably a drink invented. That literally just popped into my <laughs> and mind as you after said somebody that. <laughs> who was in exile. I'm sorry, this is a serious topic. I'm being very That's unserious. my guess though. Continue. <laughs> anyway, so um you have this struggle going on between the forces of the Bolsheviks and the sort of attempt to regain imperial power by the white Russians. Mm-hmm. The white Russian forces kept trying to recapture the imperial family. Um, In this last imprisonment, the white Russian military was very close to recapturing them again. And the um, government of the party back in Moscow finally just decided it wasn't worth allow, you know, Mm. allowing them to be recaptured or to keep moving them around. They needed to just go ahead and get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So that's when they sent the order to end them right but once again you have the problem of optics where it would have probably been fine if they had just killed nicholas because you know he's the you know the bloody tyrant Mm. the emperor who didn't care about the people but you have the problem of his wife and children Mm -hmm. so they want to end all of them so there are no loose ends but no one wants to be responsible for it because it just looks bad. Mm-hmm. 
So they basically tried to obscure what happened as much as possible. Right. Which brings us to what happened, which is horrific and has been the subject of, as we said earlier, many, many things. Movies, books, accounts, movies, all all, so many. It's because it's just so it's so horrendous. Um, they took him to the the basement, I, I believe, of an outbuilding, as I recall, or the house. I think it was an outbuilding of the house. And they had told him, you know, get ready. You're 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 going to be traveling. So they're all dressed and they have well, all their. Well, other kind of women there, they? Yes. Mm-hmm. They had all their, you know, possessions, so to speak, or as it were. And they have him in there waiting. And basically the firing squad just goes in and does what they do. But interestingly, the they kill the czar almost immediately, mm-hmm. but it takes them nearly 20 minutes to kill the remaining of family members, the, the wife and the children, because many of them have jewels and so forth sewn into their clothing. Yes. Which makes it's just horrible, which made it harder for, you know, the bullets to get through mm-hmm. or to like just it's just terrible. So they that's the death no, that they meet. Survive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In the summer of 1918, they then load the body. I actually watched a documentary fairly recently in preparation for this. They load the bodies into like a trailer wagon mm-hmm. type of deal. Bro. Yeah. And take it out into the middle of the woods, which also has a name that I can't remember. It's famous because of this. And they have this massive hole. They put the bodies in the hole. They douse the bodies with acid and then proceed to burn them for yes. multiple days, as you say, because they don't, you know, no one wants to be responsible for it. They want to eliminate as much uh, evidence as possible. Basically, if they could have just made them disappear, they would have. Yeah. That was the hope that it would just, they would just be gone and no one would question it and it would be over. Right. So they bury them, they leave, everything proceeds as it proceeds. And then it's not until, um, well, and then you have the whole, did Anastasia die? Did she, did she live? That that whole story, which we mm-hmm. now know she died with the rest of her family. Um, and you had people that claimed to be her and, and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not until... Well, there was a problem with these, since they didn't find the bodies out that time. That yeah, were, everyone's looking for them, of course, which makes sense. But it's not until the late 70s that, um, I forget how, but someone discovers the remains in the woods. Yes. All these. And, you know, with with what had gone on in Russia, it could have been anybody from from whatever, you know, it could have been who knows. But they find all these bones buried in the in this woods. What was it? Somebody that had been looking for them. I can't remember. Okay, so. That's right. So, okay. Thank you for yes. reminding me. So the gentleman that found the remains had been on the hunt for the remains of the royal family for however long. He found the body in 1979. So in 1979, when the USSR is still intact, he finds the remains and decides not to tell anyone or whatever because I mean it's the Soviets. You don't want he didn't want to risk them doing something you know hideous with it. So I think he just kind of keeps it to himself for the mm-hmm. most part. And then is it? After the fall of the Soviet Union, um, it becomes public. And of course, the scientific community gets involved and they proceed to do all kinds of testing. Um, Back then, when they first started with the remains, the the testing, DNA wasn't a thing that we knew of. Um, So they're trying to identify them with more um, primitive means. DNA was understood, but accurate DNA testing hadn't been that, developed yeah, that's, yet. Yeah, 23 and me had didn't exist yet. <laughs> so they're basically they're they're just trying to identify, I guess is it a man, is it a woman, mm-hmm. you know, adults, children, the number of bodies, how they died. Yeah, how they died, it adds up to the number of the the number of the uh members of the imperial family that were killed and all that. And then it's not until the 90s, is it the 90s when they then proceed to do DNA testing, mm-hmm. which I believe it's correct. We talked about this before. Prince Philip participated in that because yes. he was a member of the family, a, you know, 
descendant yes through, through the maternal line which is why his dna was helpful mm -hmm. so through that they're able to identify most of them i think there was a hiccup with was it anastasia and alexi it was, yes that they no, couldn't identify no. until the what is it the early to mid 2000s what year was it 2018? Oh, I'd need to look that up. Was it twenty? But it's it was pretty recent. It it took a long time between that, which was I think like ninety five, ninety six something, to when they finally could put the the end on it and say they're all here, they're all you know the members, and that's which it. is understandable because of the condition of the body. Yeah, it's amazing they, they were had able to, to do with. that. As far as I'm concerned, but they had their um, kind of Orthodox Church funeral in 1997. Mm -hmm where you know remaining members of the Romanov family were there and mm -hmm. dignitaries and all that oh okay so in 2018 yeah. they moved them with the rest of the when they were official royals okay yeah and i think at the same year either the russian government or something they acknowledged the day for the Romanov. Yeah, the government acknowledged well, it. Well, yeah, because um, in recent years, the um, government has become very interconnected with the Russian Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. So official church holidays and events are recognized mm -hmm. by the government. And now the entire family mm -hmm. are all saints. So they all have their own saints day. Do you know the house that they were where they were killed, that it was torn down by, I believe, was it... Y it wasn't Yeltsin. It was um, oh, I can't what remember. Like, I don't. Which one came when after the Soviet Union? Yeah, it. Oh, gosh, I can't remember which one. Yeah, the the one that tore down the house what because it had become this like pilgrimage, pilgrimage site. site. It was it was before the fall of the the USSR. I can't oh, remember man, the name. It's man. on the tip of my brain. Is it Gorbachev? But that doesn't sound like him. No. He wasn't that kind of guy. Anyway, I should have I should have written it down. But anyways, it was torn down, and now there's a, there's a church built on that site. Mm -hmm. I think it's called in English the something of the blood, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, so it's sort of a rebirth of their image after mm -hmm. their rediscovery and canonization. This is the information about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. It it it, 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 it house. It's another thing I can't pronounce these things. Yep. Okay. Let's see here. Um, who tore it down? I'm looking here. Luke, keep talking while I oh, look at okay. this. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, Boris like, Yeltsin. I thought that's who it was. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So um, the Politburo uh, shiver mm. <laughs> decided to take action. Um, Declaring that the house was not of, listen to this, declaring that the house was not of, quote, sufficient historical significance. Which means they wanted to ignore it. Precisely. <laughs> okay. So. That's funny. I didn't think that that would be something he would even care about. That's why I kind of second guess myself. Like, are you, I don't know if that was him, but it was. Huh. Okay. All right. So we've covered a lot of ground here. We probably need to wrap it up. But I I find it interesting because you know me and all the, the modern royally type stuff is that um, not only are there remaining members, descendants of the Romanov family, but they have their own association. Yes. But did you know that the main, I guess there it's, people disagree, hence the, the conflict, but the, um, the pretender to the, Throne Grand Duchess Maria, and I'm going to butcher this last name. I'm so sorry, Vla Vla Vladimir Mirna. Vla how do you how do you say this name? Vladimirovna. Thank you. You're in charge from now on. Well, uh, <laughs> so she... uh, interesting background to that. The reason why they always have the two names is because um, with uh, female members of the family, it's always their first name, and then their second name is always the feminized version of their father's name. Yeah, so, so she like her and then she's the daughter of this. There guy. you go. In incidentally, um I don't know if she's technically considered a little bit more legitimate if this is just a matter of degrees, but she's not a member of the family association. Guess why? Because she feels that not everyone a part of the association is like 
how do I put this in street terms? Legit enough. <laughs> like they're not close. There's another one. His name is Prince Andrew Romanoff, who um, he is the great, great grandson of Nicholas the first. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, he's he has what is referred to as the rival claim to the throne, which is supported by the Romanoff Family Association. Yes. And they're following the terms of succession that say that women can't inherit. Right. Which to me would, unless something was changed, I mean, that was the last thing that stood before everybody was overthrown. So if you're going to go back to that, it would make sense that it would be him and not her. I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying so like, it was the end. That, was the end of the that was the end of the monarchy. That was yeah, the rest of the family. Years. They scattered all over the world. Mm -hmm. And then there are some interesting members of the family at extended members that i think are worth mentioning we of course know about the lake late prince philip duke of edinburgh he um he was the grand nephew of alexandra the last tsarina i didn't realize he i mean that's not super close but it's closer than i thought it was for whatever reason then there's um princess olga okay say the name for me please read the name I'll do my best um, Princess Olga Andrea v. Romanov. Okay, I think. she she's another, I guess, notable um, member. And then, let's see. There, oh, Prince Michael of Kent, who is, I think, he was second cousin to the late Queen Elizabeth II. Mm. First cousin, excuse me, first cousin. And you know, so that's another member of the British royal family. And you know, everybody is all the royal people are related. <laughs> I know. <laughs> then you have there. the late King Constantine II of Greece, who, as mm -hmm. we know from teen shenanigans, was the godfather of Prince William. That's right. Okay, and then this one is interesting. I didn't know this. Hugh Grovesner, who is the seventh Duke of Westminster, one of mm -hmm. the wealthiest men. Um, and that's another thing from Tea and Shenanigans, which I'm not going to mention here, but there's like drama with his wedding that's coming up in, well, the, in the summer. In the world in the UK. <laughs> um, he's one of the world's youngest billionaires. Oh, so wow. I'd okay. say one of the wealthiest people in general. Um, he's also godfather to Prince George, who is the oldest oh, okay. son and, you know, heir yeah. behind Prince William and all that. I don't want to get into like Tea and Shenanigans stuff here. Go to YouTube. Listen to that. Go we'll there. cover that another day. Anyway, I didn't realize that he, you know, as you say, they're all related, but I just thought those were notable names for this family. But anyways, um, this has actually turned out to be a lot more information than I thought we were going to cover today. Mm -hmm. Hats off to you, Luke, for just, you know. Of course, always Doing having my best. it. If anybody noticed something I got wrong, feel free to comment about it. I'm sorry. I'm doing my best. Oh, no, please. Yeah, of course. I think I've said before, but it's for me. I'm speaking for myself. This has turned out to be um, kind of a, a great way to become more educated on these topics because we have to I have to read so much and learn so much before we're able to do this. It's it's more of a, you know, for my own personal development. And if anyone else happens to be listening we're glad you're here. But we're just talking. We're just, you know, here sitting here um, shooting the breeze, so to speak. Yeah. And this one's interesting because it kind of goes through this weird roller coaster of, you know, like they're the imperial family of all Russia. And then, you know, they're the evil tyrants who are oppressing the people. And then they're martyrs. Mm -hmm. And then it's like it's all over the place. It's such a testament to the, you know how times change and yes. different generations and how you view history and you know, all that stuff. But anyway, I think we've come to the end for today. Um, there's a recommendation. There's a show on Amazon Prime called Rasputin. There's a show called there's Rasputin on Amazon. Okay. Uh, it was about how Rasputin got involved in the beginning, but then they ended the show. I think it got kind of a refusal from the Russian side. Oh, I haven't seen it. Not just the Russian church. Uh, the, the Orthodox thing, church didn't care for it. Man. He was into before he joined the church. He was black. Oh, well, mm -hmm. deal with like black magic. Like I think he was continually involved like with those things. Yeah. Anyways, oh, we had mentioned before. Um, we had. We started out with our uh, On This Day in Royal History segment, and then I don't know why we dropped it. I guess it just didn't fit into some of the episodes. I think we forgot. I kind of <laughs> did, to be honest with you. Okay, so a fun one for today. On This Day in Royal History in 1141, oh, like 
Empress, you got, yeah, you got excited about I it. I love this period of history. Empress Matilda becomes the first female ruler of England, adopting the title Lady of the English. Yes. She's the granddaughter of William the Conqueror. Right. Which I definitely know of him. I don't know much about her, which means we're going to have to do an episode, right? Yes. And it's kind of... Oh, not that Matilda. <laughs> Different Matilda. Yeah, she's very interesting. And that whole time period of the British royals and France and just all, all yeah. of that. Over okay, there. so th- in other words, stay tuned because we're probably going to be covering her. Definitely. Maybe even next time. I don't know. Okay, well, uh, we, we, we've we done enough here t- for today, don't you think? I think so. Well, let's wrap it up. Okay, wonderful. Um, if you stuck with us all this time, thank you. You're a trooper. We appreciate your time. We really hope that you've been enjoying this content as much as we've been enjoying making it and you know bringing these um, sometimes often spoken about uh, events and people and sometimes lesser known, um, but we feel that they all deserve kind of their time in the sun. They all just dis- deserve discussion and, um, you know, to be remembered because whether they were good or bad or whatever your opinion is of them, or whether you agree with monarchy or not, in any case, they all had a very big noticeable impact on history. Um, they were interesting in their own right. And so we, we, you know, we just think it's worth talking about. That's why we're here. Yeah. And so, it's always worth looking at cause you can always learn something. Oh, absolutely. My goodness. Um, but with all that being said, thanks for listening. Of course, make sure to check us out on our various social media platforms. We'd love to hear from you. Yes, please leave us a comment. Send us a message. If you have suggestions for future episodes, if you're interested in a particular dynasty or time period in history or anything like that, don't be shy. Let us know. Uh, we've had a few suggestions that we've done episodes off of one of them being Belgium. So if you're interested in that, make sure to check it out. But uh, that's it for us today. Thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye. The Royal Chronicles is written and produced by Hannah Muhana and Luke Haney. Executive producer, Mustafa Muhana.